All right. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our session on unified observability, AIOps, and incident response for AWS. We tried to put as many buzzwords in there as we could to get you here, and it worked. So, hi. Um, my name is Greg Leffler. My title is Observability Practitioner. That doesn't mean anything. Um, really, what it means is I was an SRE before I came to work here. Uh, I have been on call many, many times uh, and don't have fond memories of it. So, uh, incident response is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I would love to just see a show of hands how many of you uh, have been on call like in the past month? Uh, about half-ish. Um, is anybody on call right now? Wow, all right, well, good luck. <laughs> um, so we're gonna talk about a couple of things today. Um, then Kat will join us in the second half of the presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, sort of what is observability, which you know, is, everybody has their own opinion on it. Uh, we have our opinion as well. Uh, I think ours is the best definition, obviously, or I wouldn't say it. Um, and I'm gonna talk about open telemetry, which is a really critical part of an observability journey uh, and something that's really important to understand uh, to get the benefits out of observability, uh, we really think you need to use open telemetry. Uh, then we're also gonna discuss some best practices in observability and AI ops, uh, and we're gonna give you uh, some upcoming Splunk uh, incident intelligence uh, product announcements uh, that will be super fun as well. So uh, with that, I'm gonna jump right into the first topic of what is observability. Before I do that, I do wanna sort of talk about why, uh, why is observability, which isn't really the right thing to say, but um, why do we care about observability? And one of those things is uh, there is a lot more digital stuff happening in, in the world. And since 2020, there was some sort of unpleasantness um, that made pretty much every interaction digital at some point, right? You weren't physically doing things, you weren't physically going out, but you still needed stuff. You still needed groceries, you still needed to shop, you still needed to talk to people, and all those interactions moved online, right? During 2020, we saw 70% increase in internet use, a 76% increase in e-commerce transactions. That 65% of customer transactions are now digital. That's of all the customer transactions, right? Almost two thirds of them are digital. That number's probably a lot higher now. So building reliable, well-performing digital infrastructure is super important. Trying to do that um, has become more complicated over time, right? Um, as companies realize, hey, we have customers that want to do these things online, we need to figure out how to make our infrastructure and our applications work in a modern distributed world. So you sort of start over here on the left, um, which I, is where I grew up in sort of the old school world where you had uh, a monolith or you know, a three-tier web app, something like that. Um, there was a firewall between dev and ops. Everybody did their thing. You know, we got the code running and it was fine. Development in that model is a little slow. Um, there are some problems with sort of getting people to work together and in delivering software quickly, right? being able to adapt and to make changes. So people started to move to the cloud. And as you move over to the right on this graph, you see there's sort of a breakup of applications into more services. They're less dependent on each other. The dev teams and the op teams are working together. You don't have huge pieces of infrastructure. You have tons and tons of tiny little pieces of infrastructure that all work together. And that's great because you can develop a tiny piece of software a lot faster than you can develop a big piece of software. But that's also not great because now you have thousands and thousands of changes happening every single day, right? You push out a new feature to microservice X and microservices A through Q all have dependencies upstream, downstream, all that stuff. So there are more changes happening now than ever before. Even what would be simple applications are more complicated than they ever have been before. If you look at this totally hypothetical bank, um, you can see that a bank has a bunch of services all over the place. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see there are lots of services that banks run that are on-premise. They're giant mainframes named HAL that live in the basement, right? Um, there are public cloud services, there are private cloud services, there's serverless stuff. Like one of, our, one of our banking customers has a lot of their consumer mobile app runs on Lambdas, right? Like there are so many things where there could be problems, uh, where there could be changes, where there could be issues. And every touch point your customer has uh, interact with those services in different ways. So a customer can go into a bank branch, they can say, hey, I wanna look at the balance in my account, so we need to talk to the account service. Well, that needs to talk to a public cloud thing, that needs to talk to a mainframe, that needs to talk to some VMs. Um, then a different customer on their phone says, I wanna sign up for a loan, right? So you have to sign up for the credit bureau APIs, the loan services, you know, Lambdas. Like there are so many interactions with modern applications that it's really, really challenging to even understand what the heck is going on with any sort of application, with any sort of problem. So 
One example of this uh, is from a major telecom company that was troubleshooting issues. They had a pretty mature setup, right? They were doing the right thing. They were getting incidents. They were coming in. They were dealing with them appropriately, uh, except in this case, right? They get an alert that says gift card V2 service has a problem. It's two in the morning. And so you, as the knock operator, have to think, is this worth waking somebody up over and getting yelled at if I picked the wrong thing? And is it really that important to the business? You know, nobody has any idea if it's important to the business, right? There are hundreds of other services that are running all at one time. Legacy tools don't have any business context. You can't tell if this is something that's important or if it's something that isn't. Uh, spoiler alert, this was really important because this was the night before a major marketing promotion related to a certain phone that you probably all have um, that was going to issue gift cards as part of that transaction. The service was broken. The marketing campaign had problems. Customers were unhappy. Angry tweets all over the place, right? So like not having appropriate visibility into what's going on, not having observability into is this service important, right? Where does it fit in the business context of us selling people phone plans, right? Where does that fit in? You didn't know, and they had a lot of problems because of it. So we feel like it's time for, for a new approach to how to solve problems, how to deal with uh, the digital world that we live in. And you can take the, the standard, like oh, we have the old thing on the left, the new thing on the right, right? But, um, sort of what we've seen people do over the past five years is they have some visibility into their infrastructure, they have some visibility into their apps, they're getting more, right? But you don't know how those applications fit into a business workflow, right? What is the thing that this is doing? Are we selling widgets? Are we getting people to sign up? Like, what is the goal? Um, that's been missing. Also, like, manually setting up alerts is just the worst thing in the world, right? Like, finding the right threshold, figuring out if it's something that you need to make it a priority one alert or priority two alert. What about the interactions between different services? Like, it's a huge mess to try to manually do it. So, proactively spotting unknown problems, right? Finding the root cause for you so you don't have to do that is a better world, right? Um, when you have hundreds of services that talk to each other, it would be great to be able to pull up one screen and have it say, hey, it's here, here's the problem. Um, so that's what we're trying to move to uh, with observability as well. We also have tool sprawl, siloed tools, right? I would do another raise your hand if you've used more than five tools this week and probably everyone's hand would go up, right? Like um, there's a lot of places to look for things. And that also sucks, right? Having to figure out which one of the tools it's in. Oh, that service moved to the other thing yesterday, and oh, this service hasn't been integrated anywhere yet. No, we don't know where that service is looked at. Um, it's really difficult to figure out where do you find the problem and who can fix it, right? The other thing is once you figured out something is wrong, like maybe the second worst thing about being on call is when you get a page at 3 a.m. and they say, oh, the Fliebermeister service is down, and you're like, I don't work on Fliebermeister. And well, you're awake, so why not start looking at it, right? Um, finding the right person is really, really important. And getting it to the right person means the incidents get solved faster, which means your customers are happier because your site's not down or slow or otherwise having a problem. Uh, and then finally, a lot of other tools and uh, some other Splunk products uh, have led you to do uh, down the path of sort of using proprietary instrumentation, right? Doing work that gets your, gets your data into their system, but kind of locks you into using that system in the future. Um, and that's terrible, right? Like, uh, as, as an SRE, you're always like, we don't want to do toil, right? Instrumenting your services, capturing, troubleshooting data, getting that into another system, that's all toil, right? Like, you want to do it one time and never have to worry about it again. So, on the right side, like this is the future. This is observability, this is where the goals are, um, and we can get you there pretty fast. So let's talk a little bit about finally answering that question, what is observability? Right? And uh, the top answer, you know, depends on who you ask, uh, which is certainly true. Uh, metrics, traces, and logs, right? Everybody's heard that, the three pillars of observability. Uh, that isn't observability. Those are data sources, right? That's like saying a cheeseburger is meat, lettuce, and tomatoes, right? Like, that's, those are the parts that make up observability, but that isn't observability. Uh, the term observability came from some really stuffy scientific world called control theory back in the late 
20s, I want to say. Um, and the definition they came up with was the ability to infer the state of a system by examining its output. Uh, yes, full points, you read the Wikipedia article, great. Um, but you can't really understand what that means. Like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Um, of course, I work for a vendor, so half of you are probably saying, hey, it's a great new thing to spend money on, which, yes, we would love for you to spend money on it. But uh, really, what observability is, is it's a way to investigate things that you couldn't know would break, right? Because the infrastructure is so complicated. There's so many dependencies in so many different ways. You can't anticipate that a butterfly flapping its wings in Taiwan creates a tornado in your backyard, right? Um, it's the same with modern services. Uh, and the way you do this is by instrumenting everything. You want to collect data from every single service, from every user interaction, from everywhere you can, and then rely on tools to help you make sense of all of that. Right? That's a volume of data that you couldn't even imagine. Right? It's one of the things that, ironically, that we sell is like, we can live tail your logs across your entire infrastructure. How on earth would that be useful? Like, <laughs> you would have tens of thousands of lines flying by, right? You need to see the right thing. So observability tools are really about taking all your data and telling you this is a thing you should care about. This is important. So what are the components of an observability system? You can see them up on the slide. Um, today I'm going to talk about application performance monitoring. Then Kat's going to talk about incident response. Uh, we also think the other components are important. Digital experience monitoring includes synthetics uh, and real user monitoring. So you can see what your users are doing on your application or your site. Uh, you can see synthetically, like you can create fake users and make sure that they're having a good experience uh, in different geographies with different browsers, you know, all sorts of different scenarios that you would want to test. Infrastructure monitoring is important. Like even in a fully cloud environment, there is still infrastructure involved, right? You have EC2 instances, uh, lambdas are, are serverless, but there's still a server. The code doesn't just run out of thin air, right? Um, you need to be able to take care of the infrastructure and see that it w it's working the way that it should be. Um, and logs are always going to be part of this, right? Um, logs are the thing that tells you why something is broken. So you need to have a good tool to look at logs. So I'd say these are the things that make up observability. If you look across the bottom of the slide, we talk about some things, that, some capabilities, I guess, that we need to have for an observability platform. Uh, full stack really just means you'd want to be able to follow a user's transaction from their website, from their, app, uh, from their computer, from their phone, in your app, all the way through to the back end database, from to the back end person picking the widget off the shelf and putting it in the box. Like you want to be able to keep track of the whole process from end to end. Analytics powered really means you can look at the data in different ways. You can do op mathematics operations on it. You can figure out, are there sudden changes? Is this anomalous over time? Um, you want to be able to not just see, hey, there's data, but to make sense out of that data and to do things that are useful with it. Enterprise grade, eh, boo, enterprise. But um, <laughs> enterprise grade is really there so that your product can grow with you over time. Right. Um, you also want to be able to break up dashboards so that one person doesn't log in and see 1,600 dashboards, and it's like, all right, I care about this one, right? So just show me that one. Um, there's also compliance and regulatory issues that you're going to run into, right? You want something that can handle those as well. Uh, and then finally, open telemetry native. Open telemetry is so important that it has its own section, so we'll skip that for right now. Um, and then finally, we want you to think about doing this across everywhere your application is deployed, right? Um, Effectively, nobody has all of their eggs in one basket, right? Nobody is running just in one public cloud provider or just on premise. Well, there's probably people just running on premise, but um, you know, you want to be able to integrate your data wherever it lies, right? So if you have part of your app in Google and part of your app in Amazon and part of it in Oracle and part of it in Alibaba and part of it in Azure, right? You want to be able to look across all of those to figure out what's going on and how transactions are working across all those different environments. So briefly, I want to talk about APM. Uh, APM is super exciting. Uh, one of the reasons why APM is super exciting is because, remember earlier when I said, wouldn't it be great if we told you where the problem was? Hey, look, we tell you where the problem is. It's this angry red dot. Uh, and actually, there's another angry red dot up here. And if you were to mouse over one of them, we can actually tell you, hey, the problem is in service X, call Y. Uh, if it's in the right language, we can say it's called from this function in this, line of, in this source file on this line. Right? Like we can tell you all of this from looking at one place, no matter how this environment is set up. Right? And this changes, of course, all the time. Right? Uh, I used to work at LinkedIn, and one of the things that we did was we printed out a map of all the services and how they all called each other. And it took up from here to over there and still wasn't complete. Right? And it was out of date as soon as we started printing it. There's new services, there's new dependencies. You really need something like this in a modern environment to keep track of What's talking to what, 
Where are the problems? When something goes wrong, we see it all the way upstream in the front end service, but what's actually broken? And in the old days, that's looking through hundreds of lines of logs, that's trying to grep across you know, thousands of machines to find errors. Like it's so much easier to just have the software tell you, hey, this is where the problem is. Uh, and that's one of the things you get with an APM product. Our product has a bunch of unique things that are up here on the slide. I'm not gonna try to sell you Splunk APM. Like APM is good, our APM is good. Um, one of the things that's really unique is that we don't sample anything. So every single transaction that comes through, you can see. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the, you know, if you're having some weird, bizarre problem that your CEO can't do something, like that'll be the transaction that doesn't get sampled. And you're like, well, I don't know, try it again. Um, you don't have to worry about that with our product. And then one of the other features is unlimited cardinality exploration, which sounds like something out of a sci-fi novel, but uh, it's really about being able to tag every single user interaction with data about that user. So you can say, hey, this transaction is from user ID 5500 and it happens user ID 5500 is the CEO, and we can go look and see what does that person's interactions with the site look like? What services do they hit? What kind of performance did they see? What kind of problems did they have? And you can do that with a field like user ID that could have hundreds of millions of, of, of data points, right? Um, that's not something that almost any of our competitors can even come close to handling. So once you start to think about, hey, what if we could see for our big spenders or for our uh, you know, beta testers, like what kind of performance are they seeing? What problems are they seeing? You really start to look at problems in a different way. So APM, super, super powerful. Um, it's like my favorite capability, so come talk to me if you would like to learn more about it. Um, but it's something that's really important. And one of the reasons why it's important is this example from a, uh, a large insurance company uh, that was a Splunk Cloud customer, uh, but they were like, hey, we wanna get more about this observability thing, and you know, what's it gonna do for us? Uh, well, this is one of the things that it did for them. Um, if you look at the quote, this is a software engineer that's saying, we've never had visibility like this before. Previously, it would have taken days and dozens of people to figure out what the problem is. In this case, they found this problem in six minutes. Right? And if you look here at the slide, one of the things you'll see is this P90 for one of the hosts was 30 seconds, and for the other two, it was two seconds. Uh, this was a busy service. The service was getting about 200 queries a second for a very heavyweight, very complicated query. It was in quoting an insurance policy, right? So that has a lot of backend dependencies. There's a lot of things going on. And you can imagine people aren't gonna be super thrilled with having to wait 30 seconds when the average response time for it is two seconds. Uh, but with APM, they were able to isolate, hey, it's just this one host that has the problem in the first place. And then from that host, because we have tagging for everything, they could see the requests that were taking longer were used in one particular site, right? So they could find that out in just a few minutes, figure out what was wrong, and fix it. And that's really the goal, right? Get done with being on call and go back to watching TV or you know, whatever you were doing. So, We've talked about what observability is, we've talked about why it's useful. Uh, now my second favorite thing in the world is open telemetry, uh, that I would love to sort of give you an overview of what open telemetry is. Uh, first, I guess, we should talk about what telemetry is. Uh, telemetry is uh, data about what's going on on your site that's useful for observability. Uh, traditionally, we say these are metrics, traces, and logs, right? The three key pillars of observability. Uh, those are telemetry data, right? Um, open telemetry, of course, supports metrics, traces, and logs. Uh, it also supports events, uh, profiling frames. There's a bunch of other things that are coming. It's uh, basically a lightweight, extensible framework that lets you emit this, these pieces of data about your application to an observability system. Uh, open telemetry is not an observability system. That's like, you know, Jaeger, something like that. Um, open telemetry is just the way that the data gets into the system. It is the second busiest cloud native computing foundation project uh, behind a little hobby project called Kubernetes. Uh, um, we have about 800 people a month uh, that contribute to open telemetry. Uh, there's thousands of contributions a week. It is a very busy project that's managed in a true open source way. Um, Splunk does employ many people that work full-time at OpenTelemetry, but it, it is not a Splunk product. Um, almost all of our competitors commit into OpenTelemetry all the time. Uh, we really wanna make sure that it's the way to get data into observability because that benefits everybody, right? It's easier to move you to Splunk if you have OpenTelemetry, sure, come over, right? Um, it's easier for you all to only do the work one time. It's like we do OpenTelemetry, we do it once, we do it right, and then you can take your data wherever you wanna go with it. Like, 
fundamentally it's your data, right? you own it, and you shouldn't have to worry about, oh, what if we want to change platforms or build our own platform? Um, open telemetry is really its freedom for your observability related data. Uh, open telemetry also does automatic instrumentation for a lot of languages. Now, of course, automatic instrumentation can't understand like certain pieces of your business, but it can understand how your application operates internally. It can figure out uh, which applications call which other applications and how that works. And that's supported in many languages, which makes it easier to deploy. Um, there's also a lot of commercial products and open source projects that are shipping with open telemetry support built in. So the fastest instrumentation is the one you don't have to do at all. <laughs> that's another thing uh, that open telemetry enables as well. OpenTelemetry has support of all these great logos. Uh, we support all of these programming languages. We also support more of them. These are the ones that are supported by Splunk and our support staff uh, and you know, that we will happily guide you through setting up. Uh, the OpenTelemetry project itself supports a ton of other ones, including uh, you know, your boutique languages like Rust and that sort of thing. Um, again, it's open source, so if it doesn't support a language you like, well, you know where to send pull requests, right? And we'll, we'll merge it in. Um, but uh, the Open Telemetry project uses a single open source agent, the Splunk distribution of that agent's open source as well. Um, but it's one thing that you need to run and one framework you need to use to get your data in from any kind of application written in basically any language you're going to write anything modern in, <laughs> at least. So if you want to get started with Open Telemetry, there's a couple of things you can do. One is you can scan the QR code that I put scan me on because I, I thought that frame was neat. Um, that will take you to a page called Pipestorm, which is an interactive game that we wrote at Splunk to teach you about the open telemetry data pipeline. Right? How does stuff get into and out of the open telemetry system? It goes through a pipeline made up of receivers, processors, and exporters. Uh, receivers and exporters kind of do what they sound like, um, and I guess processors do too, um, but processors are a way for you to manipulate data before you send it to your observability system. Uh, we support an arbitrary number of receivers and exporters, so that means, yes, you can send your data to Splunk and to Jaeger, to Splunk and to your own thing, to your own thing and Datadog, well, maybe not Datadog, um, but you can send your stuff to anyone that supports open telemetry, uh, and you can do that in multiple ways all at the same time with one agent and one pipeline. Super, super easy. So uh, if you can't scan the QR code or you don't want to play on your phone, it works on your phone, but you know. Um, pipestorm.splunk.com is the website for the OpenTelemetry Pipestorm game. Uh, and then the OpenTelemetry Project's website is opentelemetry.io. So with that, my time up here is done. I'm going to pass it over to Venkat, um, who's going to talk to you about best practices in observability and AI ops. Uh, and then he's also going to show you a demo of our new incident intelligence features. So Venkat, there, there you are. Thank you, Greg. Can you all hear me? OK, cool. So first of all, huge thank you. I know it's a packed schedule. And thank you all for taking time. And we all even have, I mean, thanks to even the workflow, overflow um, audience that are watching from Venetian. And uh, so um, I think one second. I think there's this slide. So quick introduction, my name is Venkat Raipudi. I'm a product manager at uh, Splunk. Prior to that, I was an analyst. Prior to that, I have, again, my background is all ops and SRE. And um, so today I'm gonna show you, so I think you got a good understanding of the theory. Now, um, this is all about how you implement it uh, through Splunk. Now, uh, before I jump in, uh, any, how many of you are Splunk customers? How many of you use Splunk? Okay. That's like pretty much 90%. Anyone using Splunk APM right now? Okay, few. Cool. So if you really look at the current state of observability, um, I think let's talk about the next slide, right? If you really look at um, the, ma the challenges uh, regarding observability and incident management and talking to a lot of Splunk customers, there are three different things that they always point out, right? One is unplanned downtime, uh, which I'm sure like all of you are like ops background and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's also this uh, swivel chair thing. You have five to seven to 10 to 20 to 30. I mean, I, I know some companies even use like 70 different monitoring solutions across their organization. And there's also this aspect about accelerating mean time to resolution. So these are some common problems I'm sure you are. And what I'm gonna cover is how you can achieve uh, addressing these challenges 
through Splunk APM. So everything I'm going to show, so I'm going to go through, so just to show, kind of walk you through what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk you through some concepts and feature overviews and why we are doing it. And I'm going to do a quick demo of the product as well. Okay. So before I jump in about introducing Splunk Incident Intelligence, firstly, Splunk Incident Intelligence is part of APM. This is not another <laughs> product in your tool set. So it's part of the Splunk APM. And if you really look at why we are doing this right before what, if you look at the market, there are a lot of solutions that provide you with observability data, right? Logs, metrics, and traces. There's a lot of them. And then you have a set of tools that actually do maybe some event correlation, but they don't store data, they only provide even correlation. Um, and there are some solutions that do incident response, like purely designed for notification, like uh, routing policies and notifications, right? Identifying the right. And often one of the reasons for uh, kind of tool overload you're having is because you have different vendors doing different things and we are trying to address that problem in kind of bringing all this together. So we're going to have incident intelligence is going to be part of Splunk APM, and it's going to do a single solution that's going to do event correlation, as well as um, the on-call management, which is the incident response, as well as the automated action, so that you don't have to go through different solutions and everything is in one place. So let, I'm going to walk through a few slides in terms of how it works, right? If you look at really the left side where we have the detectors, and that's the current state of it, right? We have, um, again, the, the Splunk APM has RUM, Synthetic, the APM data, and you, it, it ingests external data as well, right? So, and we have this alerting concept, again, to say when something's wrong within individual component, right? When there is a user session on the front end side, there's an error, you get an alert. When there's a back end error, there's a different alert. Obviously, due to the nature of these different uh, time series databases and the data that is being organized, there's a different kind of alerts that are generated. And, uh, and it creates like a lot of noise, right? Um, kind of like overload. I mean, there's different words like alert fatigue and other things that typically cause. And we really wanted to address that, right? And kind of bring that real incident context on top of the alerts. And so the first thing we do as part of the incident intelligence is kind of provide you the context of incident by kind of grouping these different um, kind of alert into a logical business impacting incident, right? Step one. So the second step is then we also allow you to create a workflow um, on top of the incident. So, okay, you identified an incident, but what do you, what do you want to do with it, right? So there's an automated workflow that you can create on top of the identified incident, and then you map it to a on-call schedule. Again, um, we'll, we'll walk through the details in the demo, but you identify the exact responder that can take care of that problem automatically within the single platform. So this is a summary slide, which basically kind of walks you through all the different things we do, kind of like starting from a detector, which is looking for an anomaly within the metric database or logs or traces, identifying a problem. And then you have uh, the, the, the incident creation, the alert generation, uh, sorry, the grouping, uh, workflow, as well as identifying the responder. And we even take it further, right? We even assist you with the incident resolution in terms of providing with the unifying um, kind of uh, triaging center, which I'm gonna walk through, as well as uh, kind of guide you through the incident resolution, as well as the um, the, the post-mortem analysis as well. It's cool. So let's, let's walk through the high level concepts of what what incident intelligence can do, right? It's the first thing we're gonna do, help you with is the noise reduction. A lot of ops teams are usually kind of, there are hundreds and two hundreds of <laughs> alerts coming in every day. I'm sure you're, you're all part of that. And you kind of become numb to it, right? Like either you are overreacting or either you're like not reacting to the stuff you're, su look, you're supposed to look into. And there's also aspect about, okay, this is a business critical, we are losing X amount of 
revenue and we need to quit this fake fastly, right? So that's the problem number two. And there's also this, um, I'm gonna go deep dive, but there's also this unifying the incident management, right? Everything, bringing it into one context, one view, um, and also kind of accelerating. And all of these things which you're doing is gonna improve your main time to resolution, main time to acknowledge everything, right? All of your uh, KPIs. The first thing to call out here as part of this incident intelligence is we're gonna provide you with end-to-end, -end, right? You don't have to jump to a different system to notify someone and to create your incident to probably uh, some other system or to pull this particular log into a different system or look up something else to a different system, right? Everything is uh, all in one and you're able to apply and we provide a high cardinality, which uh, Greg mentioned earlier. So you're able to slice and dice the data any way, any way you see, any way you, you would like to, right? There's a lot of flexibility in terms of how you apply the filters and I'm gonna again show this later. And also, um, we also have a mobile app where you're able to kind of um, uh, respond to incidents on your mobile phone and it's all uh, seamlessly integrated into the suite. The, the other one is also, I, I think probably we are talking about incident management, but there's, um, you should definitely look up on um, our AI capabilities on, as part of the auto detectors, uh, which are auto detecting those different kinds of alerts um, as part of the workload and the data that the platform is looking into. And so all of these kind of streams of data sets that are coming in, uh, not only that we are providing the data, we are also providing the context and the relationships between, because we have the topology data and the relationships between these data sets. So we're able to provide, not only detect um, alerts, create incidents, but also provide you with the ability to drill down into a full context um, incident triaging solution. And 100% uh, invested into open telemetry and I, I I think if you look at any of the stats and like as Greg mentioned, in terms of the developer investment we're doing on open telemetry, we're 100% dedicated on that. So this is fully supported and integrated uh, with open telemetry. And lastly, the unified response, right? You don't have to, I was talking a little bit earlier, is you don't need to, uh, if you wanna do like a chat ops, you don't need to go into one solution. And if you wanna do like incident creation, you don't need to, if you wanna notify someone, you don't need to jump into this 50 different solutions. So everything is um, in one portal. Um, so it's end to end, full context and a unified response center. Um, so this is currently, this product is in um, preview mode and uh, we are um, releasing this to public. So public preview, we're calling it this as public preview, but uh, basically what it means is you can use this in production um, data uh, starting from December 12th, and uh, we have a small barcode if you would like to sign up for it, and uh, I hope you take a good advantage of it. So let me switch to demo. All right. All right, I'm gonna... All right. So this, for, the, for those that are not, oh, just to pick up. Okay, all right, it's switched now, cool. For those that are uh, not familiar with the platform, this is the Splunk APM, and you can see that um, we have the APM, infrastructure monitoring, log monitoring, RAM, uh, I didn't realize, I don't know, there's also synthetics, which is somehow not showing up here. Um, but and the incident intelligence is part of that. So one, the responders, so there's three different persona uh, user journeys I'm gonna walk through. Uh, the first one is the responder one, um, and the second one is a ops manager kind of responsible for uh, scheduling, and the third one is more of an um, observability engineer or an SRE that is building um, more of their responsibility, like the boundary, how they can define those boundaries so that they're building their responsibility and kind of add, map those responsibilities to SLOs. Yeah. Cool, so first thing is you can see, as you can see, um, let me open um, one of these, right? Uh, I think this one. So you can see that if we didn't, without incident intelligence, we would have fired 210 individual alerts, right? Um, and there is, as you can see, there's, I think, uh, 
So you can see that it, we are also able to combine the front end and the back end alerts into a single incident. And we are doing that correlation saying that, okay, these front end errors and the back end errors are related to single incident. And uh, I don't know how the Wi-Fi is going to be. So I did open some of the tabs, so I might be switching. And if you look at, um, so let's say I'm interested, okay, let me start with my front end, right? And then I can either jump straight into APM, which is on the back end, or I can say, okay, let me look at the RAM component, right? Um, I'm gonna do, um, uh, the tag spotlight, let me, oh, this, one second. So you can see that how many of uh, the sessions have different errors. I can go into different user sessions. I can, uh, again, you can see that there's a uh, error message next to this. So these are, um, so that, for those that are not familiar, so the RAM is the JavaScript that we inject and we monitor those front end, right? So these are front end browser based errors that are detected, so these are um, real customer facing problems that we are able to detect. And we provide the ability to kind of drill down from, um, again, I can pick any of these or I can, let me, I think by the time that loads. So I'm gonna see, so this is how it's gonna look like, right? So here's the session um, and then, oh, I thought I did that, cool. So you can see that the user has clicked on the cart and it, they're downloading a bunch of CSS and they have this backend error and I'm gonna um, hover on the 200. So as you can see that even though it's a HTTP 200, we are able to detect that there are backend errors that are causing functional problems here that I can also see that there's checkout service and payment service, both are um, uh, failing and I'm gonna find out why. So I can go into the workflow here and I can um, understand that Okay, checkout service and payment service are, are having issues. So again, I'm gonna go to, uh, I think it's taking time with the, uh, I'm gonna go to the, the log. Basically what, what you'll probably, you'll see is once you see, yeah, there you go. So there's a log um, that you'll see. So it's again by then. So basically it, it will give you, so as you can see the context of the timestamp and all the apps, everything is auto applied. So this is what we mean by full context that you don't have to jump into logs, metrics and traces and say, okay, this is my window of X and window of Y. And I'm applying these dimensions to this. We are doing that behind the scenes without you having to do that. And you can see that, okay, I'm able to, so if you can just recap, so I started from incident, go to the front end session. From there, I'm able to jump into the back end logs. And I can see that, again, there's an API token that is, that is invalid. So I need to refresh the token or fix that problem, right? So that's uh, number one. And uh, um, also, so quickly before we jump into that, I also wanted to show you that the little bit of the notification capabilities. So I can, I'm just creating like a manual for the demo purposes. Um, and I'm gonna create an incident and I'm gonna bring my phone here so you can see that uh, there's a uh, set of SMS as well as uh, a push notification. So I can jump into the app and I'm gonna uh, click on acknowledge and then you can see that, uh, let me see on the time, so, that I'm able to uh, synchronize the states, whether I'm pushing on the phone or on the app, and also I'm able to get SMS and push notification. Again, there's a whole set of user preferences I might not be able to run with, uh, with the time, but a whole set of notification capabilities we have. So. I'm gonna jump next to the second persona user journey, which is uh, the on-call schedules. So this is where you build a roster saying that, okay, you have a database team schedule and there's a um, network team schedule, there's a SRE team schedule. So you'll have different schedules that you can create. And I'm gonna just drill down into one of these. Um, again, we provide this schedule to be very flexible. You can create day shift, night shift. You can see that I can pick and choose any any days, any specific windows. Um, you can make it into APAC, EMEA uh, by time zone or by times. And it's pretty flexible in terms of how the uh, previews, like after schedule preview, it's very um, interactive there in terms of 
um, the adding the responders and how you map all of that. And we also allow you to synchronize these um, schedules to your Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar so that it's, it's dynamically synchronized. You don't have to download every time. Um, so I'm going to jump into the third persona, which basically brings the whole thing together now. Um, so if you uh, really look at uh, this, so this is where the observability engineers or the SREs come in and kind of like, okay, this is more of think of it, I mean, we call it a service, but this is basically a boundary of your responsibility that you want to create, right? As a SRE, I'm responsible for specific set of RUM alerts and specific set of different components. And this is, and we build this very flexible that if you really look at the metadata of the alert, you can you can build your responsibility based on any tag you see in the raw data, right? So it's very flexible in the sense that um, you can pick either a source, you can pick like already generated alert, um, whether it's based on severity, based on region, location, time, anything, right? So you can, you can slice and dice in terms of the boundary definition here, any way you see fit as well as the grouping of this in terms of, again, uh, you'll, you'll see more capabilities as we move forward here, but um, you can group based on certain conditions, either it's uh, based on the time or uh, severity, as well as we also provide the workflow, which is again, pretty flexible in terms of the steps, in terms of how you wanna escalate this. Um, and you'll also see as, as we move forward, you'll also see a lot of automation that comes in saying that if you see this change and you, 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 you meet certain conditions, you can roll back or you can say that, okay, um, notify database team, uh, and then let's say they don't respond in X amount of time or acknowledge and then notify their manager on duty or director on duty. So you can use it in the traditional escalation policy or you can use it in kind of like an automated way in terms of taking certain actions. Um, so I just wanna give you an understanding of the schedules we created. So this is where the, the mapping of the schedules is happening on the service with, with the boundary you create, right? So you, let's say I'm a database, I'm responsible for all of these Oracle databases. And so you create those kind of boundary and say like, okay, now I'm gonna map it to different database teams that you have uh, within your organization. You can map and you can map those. Cool. Uh, I think that's about the demo. And uh, I'm gonna switch back to the, so I'm gonna, Sorry. Um, that's the end of the slides I have. And I, I can, if anyone's interested again to download um, or sign up for our preview, uh, I'm gonna leave this barcode up for you all. And thank you again for attending this session. Hope, hope this is helpful. Thank you.